Hello and welcome to today's episode of Between the Spreadsheets. I've got with me today a gentleman called John Holland. And I'm particularly thrilled to have John here because he's going to tell us a bit about a subject that I've always been fascinated with. And I, I think it's very inspirational for people to consider floating their businesses, which is what John's very much involved with. So hello, John. Thanks for joining us. Morning, um, Stephen. What, what's your company called? It's called Holland Bendilo. So okay. I, I started a business, so I get to have a, my name in the, in the title. It's only fair, isn't it? It's very uh, fair. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we started in 2004. And so we, I think we've been going probably longer than most people in the stock markets. Yeah, because it's very difficult. So, so um, how, how do you get into this, into this business? Well, my path was quite interesting and probably not typical. Um, I actually was a director of a growing business in the late 80s. Um, and I left there, I did an MBA and I wanted to do something different. And the London Stock Exchange recruited me. And I ended up then uh, heading up, after some time, the UK regional operation for the London Stock Exchange, responsible okay. for the two key markets that they operate. One is called AIM, which some people will have heard of, I'm no doubt. And the other one is the main market. I, I then left the London Stock Exchange about 13 years ago, uh, after 11 and a half successful years there, and happy years to set up uh, Holland Bendula. Right. Brilliant. So, so what, what does floating a company actually mean? Yeah, it's quite an easy concept, really, although the markets do the, the best to complicate it for, for yes. companies. Um, basically, it means selling off some shares in your business or a percentage of your business to, to shareholders. Mm -hmm. But the important thing to, to say is that you retain control of that business, even though you've, you've sold off a percentage of that business. So for many companies, it's a win-win. And of course, most companies come to the, the markets and list on the stock markets to raise investment capital, to grow their businesses. Mm -hmm. That's the primary reason. Other reasons, uh, some businesses come purely for credibility and to, to enhance credibility yeah. or to introduce meaningful share schemes to incentivize employees. And in, in certain circumstances, um, shareholders might want to in existing uh, listed uh, existing private companies may come to the market to to facilitate a, a medium and longer term exit st strategy yeah. but i think the primary reasons are the cash the fundraising uh, side of things yeah yeah but it is it is um a good exit plan it is a good way of selling out without going through a, a business transfer agent <laughs> But it's but it's it's it can it can be quite expensive, can't it? It certainly can. It's not it's not a cheap option. But I think one thing that's missed uh, by companies quite frequently, um, certainly the the companies that come to us, is that the the majority of the costs of the transaction can be raised as part of the fundraising that a company undertakes when it lists. So yes, there are some upfront costs in advisor fees, lawyers, and accountants. Mm. But the majority of those fees will be back end loaded and dependent on success and taken out of the funds that the company raises so okay. that there isn't a, um, you know, there, there's, there's not a, a big hit on, on the working mm -hmm. capital and on cash right. flow. Yeah. Right. So what sort of money would somebody have to start with? So let's let's all or everyone that's aspirational to this. Let's see if they could do something now. What sort of money? Um, would they be looking at to say, like, I've got a company accounts direct, as you know, if I came to you and said, John, I, I want to float this, what are, what's my initial expenditure? And can I set that off by some, some speculative, um, some, is that a nomad or, or somebody in, in the field that could um, help me that way? So what's yeah. the cheapest way I can get into this? Well, the cheapest way, there's a number of stock markets that are available for companies and, and the smallest stock market and the least expensive is a market called Aquis. People okay. probably be, may have heard of the previous name called NEX. Uh, okay. So that's a, sm a, a small stock market, which is geared to smaller companies. Mm -hmm. So you may be looking at £150,000 for a listing on a small market such as that. And then the fees tend to go up. Uh, and reflect the, the size and credibility of, of the markets that you actually floated on and indeed the fundraisings that you undertake. So is that so, money you'd need up front or is that, no, could that, no? 
No, you wouldn't need that up front. Uh, you would a, a percentage of that, perhaps, uh, maybe fifty thousand up front, and then the rest would be certainly if they were our clients, we would uh, would ensure that the the fees are back end loaded and largely contingent on success. So that okay. if for any reason the flotation doesn't happen, then you're not faced with a huge bill uh, right. of, of advisor kit fees. Right. What I would say, though, Stephen, is it's important. I think for most companies that are thinking about doing a, a flotation is to do a feasibility exercise up front uh, okay. which we do a lot of, which we do for a lot of clients and that establishes if flotation is right for you what sort of costs might be involved and we also target those people who might be interested in supporting a flotation so mm. it reduces the risk of committing up front to a, right. uh, to a process and and costs that which might actually not deliver what you actually wanted to deliver right so so those so that initial step if you like dip that uh, dip dip in the toe in the water is probably the most important part yeah. because it will answer a lot of the questions that you have and de-risk the whole process for mm. you my my mum said she'd buy shares so that that's encouraging isn't it it is <laughs> <laughs> so so just going back to where we float we've got next oh sorry what what's the new term for that aquinas aquis Aquis, as in acquire, yeah. Aquis. And um, and then, then we've got the alternative investment, like the Ames, which is where most people want to be. And of yeah. course, the London Stock Exchange is out of league for anybody I could possibly know. Well, the London Stock Exchange actually own and operate AIM. So yeah. AIM is a, an LSE com uh, oh, okay. market. Yeah. Um, but it, it was designed to facilitate listings for smaller growing companies so the regulation uh, and to a degree the costs of joining in are more um, in line for smaller growing companies having said that the certainly costs of coming to AIM are going to be significantly more than an aqueous listing so what would and the that, cost be for AIMS yeah it, it's probably starting at 300,000 and what money would need it up front probably 80,000 I think is probably a, a good place to start but before we even put that money in there'd be some sort of feasibility study before we so what would that cost roughly uh, just roughly to, ten, probably 10,000 pounds so a, the yeah. so the first risk is 10,000 pounds ish yeah. and that would then give us a lot more confidence to find uh, the the an additional 70,000 pounds and right. then the additional 320 can be come out of the the, the income taken from investment and, and whatnot yeah so so that, that I, I think that i think even though it is a lot of money if people watching this are serious about really expanding and um, then, then having a plc and floating it on the on one of the markets is certainly uh, something to to aspire to I look at um, a PLC company, not, not just as a method of exiting a business or making extra money or growing the business, but I think from a professional basis, it's like you've reached the top of your profession, haven't you? You've reached the, the, I mean, where do you go from having floated a PLC? Incidentally, you can have a PLC without floating it, can't you? You can, but the two things are, are, are quite separate. A, a yeah. listing, the, the names are the same, but obviously that's all that's the same. Yeah. Uh, a PLC in its true sense, if you like, in terms of the, the markets is a company that's actually listed and has its shares trading yeah. on, a, on a regulated stock market. Yeah. I should also mention, because we've mentioned Aquis and AIM, mm. there are two other stock markets, both oh. also operated by the London Stock Exchange. One, uh, well, they're both called or, or come under the umbrella of mm. the main market. Yes. Okay. But within that, there's two sectors. There's one that's the premium sector, which is for the big companies. So you've got mm. the FTSE 100 companies on there. And then there's another sector called the standard sector. And that's, again, for probably smaller companies. And, and interesting, in the last year or two, we found many companies that would have normally uh, floated on AIM have mm. gone to the standard list because the cost of listing on that may be circa a hundred thousand pound less than the name so okay. so it, it it's it, it's a slight imbalance really there because you would yeah. have thought as you said earlier on being on an lse main market mm. would cost significantly more but actually the standard listing is is probably slightly less than um 
or fair, a fair bit less than than an okay. listing. Yeah, I'm so sure there's some administrative reason for that. But uh, so so in, in the main, on this particular area, the best thing to do is for people to contact you, and um, you can appraise where they're going to go. I mean, if you contact me first, I can say whether you've got a chance rather than wasting John's time. And then if, if between us we feel there is something there, then, then we can bring uh, John into the fray. So no, that, that, that's really interesting. So, so, but apart from the actual money side of things and what it will cost, are there any other criteria to, for, for you being able to float a company? The rules for the AIM market and, and, and for the Aquis market, in effect, they don't really stipulate how small a company or a large company needs to be or its profitability. So they're pretty flexible from, from, a, from a rules point of view in terms of what they would allow, uh, what type of company they would allow to come to the market. Having right. said that, the, the determining factor is whether investors will buy your shares. Mm -hmm. So as much as the regulation is flexible and you could probably tick box, most companies could probably tick box most of the AIM rules yeah. um, ahead of, of coming to market. Its question is whether if they're looking to raise a half a million or a million or two million pounds, whether investors are willing to support their business yeah. proposal. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's also, um, I, I mean, at the end of the day, you, you could have um, a startup company, a, a newly formed company, but if it's if it's exciting enough and, and you're credible enough and you can prove cash flows and you can prove profitability and you can pr so a good strong business plan i would imagine is um, is vital and i would imagine the people involved in the company i mean can anybody float do you need to have any special qualification or it can it just be anybody on the board or, or the directors or secretaries do, do they need to be anything Pretty much any any company can can flow, but there are corporate governance uh, rules. And generally speaking, even on the smaller markets, you'd be looking at a non-exec chairman and a, yeah. one other non-exec director. But those are those are probably people of, of, of the company's choice. So they're not people that the stock market would stipulate you have to have on your board. Right. But again, if you're looking to attract investment in your company, it's important that you give investors confidence by having suitable people on your board. And yeah. there are lots yeah. of people around, as I'm sure you're aware, who yes. are serial non-exec directors yes. who are very yeah. good at taking off, taking that side of, of things away yeah. from the chief exec of a, of, a, of a company. So they take on the city side. And so that the chief exec can focus on on the business and not yep. be distracted by the city side and the investor right. side, and that right. that tends to work very well actually. And and I'm I'm sure you've got a list of people that you, you could introduce. Yeah, yep. yeah, we have. And, and these are people that are paid once they're floated, or do they get paid before the floated? Yeah, generally they brought in prior to the to the listing but sometimes late on in the process. So if the process of listing is, is say, four months, then it might be a month or two months prior to the actual listing yeah. date that people are appointed to the board. Um, okay. And so investors can can have that confidence they're yeah. in place. Yeah. And that their, their salaries are, I presume, subject to market uh, value. Um, yeah, they, they are. But, but they are, but pr probably starting about £20,000 a year. Yeah. And you'd be expecting to get two or three days um, a month, and maybe more, out of some of some of those non-execs. Well, I'm in the but, wrong business. <laughs> yeah, but some of those some of those non-execs are, or most non-execs, I think nowadays are there because yeah. they deliver. They they actually add value to the company. Yeah. So they're there to tick the boxes in terms of the corporate governance, but they're also there really to add some value to the business, whether it's communicating with the city or whether it's opening doors with expertise in your company's particular sector, where they can help bring in new business to, to your company. Yeah. So companies have moved away from appointing non-execs purely because they are a figurehead to appointing people who are known perhaps to the city, but also yeah. really add some value to the business. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. That's great. Yeah, I've actually got a list of questions to ask you, but you've been answering them as we're going through. So, you know, you know you're know, making my life very difficult here. <laughs> um, you, I, I, th I think you've pretty much given everybody a lot of food for thought here in a very short space of time. So I'll go ahead and ask you, what's been your favourite project? Have you got one? 
have you got a favorite uh, i mean you don't have to name names it's more fun if you do but you know have you uh, had a favorite project yeah i have got some favorite projects well i'll yeah. tell you that uh, tend, tend not to be favorites so and not because okay I enjoy well, let's let's go it. to that one uh, <laughs> just give uh, us some gossip the, the very high tech ones and the biotech businesses uh yeah. can be quite challenging because uh, i'm not a techie and i'm certainly right. um I'm not really uh, an expert on biotech either. So yeah. when I get a 100-page business plan covering those businesses, right. it, it can give me a headache. Uh, right. But they, they can right. be great to do, but they're uh, not always straightforward. No. No. Um, property, you know, I, 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 many years ago, I was in the property uh, and, and construction sector, so in civil okay. engineering. So those are a favorite sectors of mine. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, healthcare, for obvious reasons, mm. We've got a number of healthcare uh, listings going on at the moment yeah. and re increasingly re renewable businesses as well. So yeah. those, are, yeah. those are quite exciting. Right. No, I, I, I've, I've never worked in this area, but I've worked in helping companies to franchise their businesses. And the one thing I found was that pretty much any business can be franchised, but it's the, the people involved, some of them. They just can't be, you know. And so, so it's, it's all about the person, isn't it? It's about the culture of the company as well. I think it, it must be easy to work with. So any, any unusual applicants? Well, we do probably 50% of our, our clients uh, are non-UK businesses. So they're looking to come okay. to London. And um, so we get some quite unusual ones, uh, particularly mining, uh, resource businesses, not so much the businesses uh, are unusual, but where they might be operating out of, um, right. you know, from Columbia or, or, oh, yeah, or, or where, <laughs> wherever it might be in the world. So, yeah. um, and so those can be quite challenging mm. in, in some ways. Um, and I always say it, it, it sounds it sounds exciting doing a Singapore listing, but the reality is a Scunthorpe listing is much more uh, straightforward to do simply yeah. because of the logistics of getting there and getting yeah. them down to London, etc. But uh, no, we, we, yeah, we, I think I think the geography mix sometimes makes some of these yeah. things quite interesting. Right. Well, I, no I noticed that you've been involved in in hydro mining. So how does that work? Oh well, yeah. That, is that, that is that is that the currency rather than the using water to get to get stuff out of rocks? It, it was a combination of the two, actually. Yeah, right. it was it was uh, having the uh, the location of of the mining near the near the dams and using the water then for, for the mining uh, okay. for the cooling. So uh, that was that one. Yeah. Yeah. So you've been involved in all sorts of things. I, mean, <laughs> this, this, this is a, I was I was just so wanted to get somebody like yourself on to explain the way you've done and I do appreciate that and um, I think everybody out there if if you do have any ideas or you do have a business that you think could be floated or you you have desires in that that area then then please do contact me you, you know how to reach me my my details are below and you feel free to contact John direct if you want his his details are now appearing below and I'd, I'd like to thank John very, very much for joining me today. It, it's been a, a very useful programme and um, good luck with what you do. And, and hopefully we'll be able to work together on a couple of projects in the, in the coming months. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining me today. And I know John's got to go because he's a busy man. And um, I'll, I'll see you in the next uh, podcast of Between the Spreadsheets. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Stephen. Bye.